All right, so we have to delve in to the established career of Anna Capeless. You've been all over the place, Cork, mm. then you played for Munster, then Richmond, then uh, Harlequins, you played for Ireland, you've done it all. Mm. Um, so we want uh, your old teammate, Lindsay, to introduce you and ask you some of the questions. Um, yes, long-standing friend, teammate, her lust for life, her energy, his enthusiasm is matched by that of her love, energy and enthusiasm for the game of rugby. Um, congratulations on a fantastic career and welcome to the House of Rugby, where we are going to say this is your life, <laughs> Anna Capus. Um Where do we start? What is your, what's your most outstanding memory, rugby memory? God, you could have given me a bit of homework beforehand to kind of research this. That's hard. There's a lot. Are we talking Ireland? Just your most your most memorable where you're at your happiest. Um, some moments in the dressing room with Ireland, either kind of beforehand or afterwards, not to take away from playing, but playing is such high pressure. And I think for our era, we were kind of under a lot of pressure, the kind of the... the the last couple of years playing playing with Ireland. Um, you were, you kind of, I, I came into the squad a little bit after you. I, I never had many kind of massive mar- uh, wins mm. in an Irish shirt. Some good wins and some great days out, but um, f- we were under a lot of pressure kind of the, 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 the last few years. So I think the, some moments in the dressing room, like do you remember after England, above in Coventry, Actually, sorry, it was beforehand and there was some music going on. Like, I love a bit of music in the dressing room. Yeah, we were dancing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and that's not always everyone's cup of tea, but just like felt like such a great energy. Can't remember the year. I would say 2018. Um, yeah, it was Paddy's it Weekend and I remember. Paddy's Weekend above in Coventry. We had a great performance that day, even yeah, though we lost. Yes, yeah, yeah. We played really well, but just... I remember looking around, you know, sometimes you kind of have this like out of body kind of experience in, 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 in a dressing room where you're just kind of looking around and you take it all in. That was a day for me. And I don't know why or what song was on or I just said like, lads, this is the best feeling in the world. And we were like, yeah, like all bouncing around and dancing and kind of hugging each other and um, played really well then. And we, we didn't win. It's funny, like that's kind of what I'm referring to there now. Like we'd like oh we we had a great game that day but we would have I never got to beat England do you know no but actually it probably leads me nice into my next question if Greg doesn't mind I'll, I'll pass it over is you were involved and as was I very many historic moments and milestones within the overall game of women's rugby like we had the big 14 game against Quinns and extra the weekend and myself and yourself were involved in the big game 12 when Harlequins and Leinster had an historic day out in Twickenham which was one of my favourite games rugby now I mean everything the build up how we were treated um, the game itself I got to play six and I was let loose and it was you know probably one of my best performances you scratched me in the eyeball that day I took off off. (laughs) I took him off I tackled her she put her finger in my eye and I was looking after Neil oh yeah no I did it's like remember you were saying why actually come and nails before the game yeah I did I hand you off in midfield I remember that but and I Rachel Burford tackle, by the way Rachel Burford gave out to me she goes watch the face mate <laughs> I was like oh, oh did sorry she? yeah but anyway <laughs> you what, put your foot, fingers right into well, my I'm eye I'm sorry about that I'm glad you got over it anyway my question is I suppose that's the epitome really as what we see we've been involved in major milestones but What is the biggest challenge for women's rugby and is it exhausting for the fight that you keep up taking all the time or where do you see the women's game going? Like, are you going to stay in that fight after your career? I think that's the one thing that kind of I was able to find comfort in from retiring and calling it a day with Ireland as a player. And a lot of people said it to me and and it was the one thing I was able to kind of say to myself was like, right, I know that I'm in this for the long run. So... What, I, what I've learned as a player and um, you're absolutely right the women's game is in this huge period of transition where things seem to be progressing so much but sometimes you feel like you're going backwards and um, it's been an interesting time to be like an advocate for it and as a player and like now coming into a coach or coming into management and actually that's why I went to the Women's World Cup like we obviously you know very heartbreakingly did not qualify for um the last year's World Cup 
and we all kind of we stopped talking about it we were so hurt and we were um, we couldn't believe it that we weren't going to be playing in this World Cup and for me I had already I didn't I didn't get to play the qualifiers which was very like I sat at home on the couch watching it which was like a very significant moment for me and very very like one of the lowest moments of my career actually I think is watching that on, on the television and we all kind of tried to move on and forget that it was on. But personally for me, it was like women's rugby is so important to me and how it's going to grow forward. That's so important to me because I've given so much of it so far of my life to it so far that I just I've, I know too much about it now. I can't just give that up. So I decided to, just to go as as a supporter. I know so many girls and, and you you as well, like we both played barbarians and from playing in the premiership like a lot of girls from around the world play there I know a lot of the England girls knew a lot of players in that final knew loads of girls playing in the World Cup so I was like you know what I want to go actually and be there and see what it's like to where we're at see where the women's game is at and it was it was it was brilliant and it, do you know what was so cool about it was that it was like being in a bubble where everyone loved women's rugby and it wasn't like Oh, there's a women's game on. It was like rugby. Do you have your tickets? Are you, are you, where are you sitting? Like, oh, my friend needs an extra ticket. You know, the same kind of chat we have around the men's games. Same vibe, same. It was so brilliant and nobody challenging it. Nobody like, ah, but, oh, it's just women's rugby or, oh, the women's game or none of that didn't experience that. It was just such an amazing bubble to be in for that like couple of weeks to be there. And the rugby was outstanding and it made me feel very hopeful because yeah, I feel weary a lot of the time from from constantly having to, you know, when we talk about the women's game over the last few years, instead of talking about the technical abilities of players, we're talking about the fact that players had to get changed in a next to bins, you know, and like referring back to, you know, referring back to things like that. So, um, sorry. Am I answering your question or did I just go off on a big, uh, <laughs> on a big No, I think there? we're like, we're right. Like there, there is so many positives and like, let's be clear, your career has been what you started off with Munster. Uh, you played for Ireland, you played for Barbarians, you played for Gloucester, who are now probably one of the top two teams in the in the Premiership. Mm. Um, you've gone away and played in Australia, you've played for Richmond, you played with Queens. So you've played an exceptional amount of rugby. So you've had a fantastic career, but oh, I suppose... Yeah knowing you and knowing a lot of the things and watching you on Twitter like you, you always fight the good fight you know and um, yeah I just wanted to see did you know I suppose sadly you retired because your own I suppose up and down of your own career you know mm. highs and lows so yeah you seem to still have the energy to fight the, the good mm. fight for it do you know yeah yeah, and yeah. we're very good on this show like Greg has you know would have watched the World Cup gone on the 7 series so when you're a rugby player and, and you love it you take the game for the at the baseline of what it is like you give it a chance you know mm -hmm. and it really is on this upward trajectory mm -hmm. um, but I suppose where do you see what needs to so how do you think Ireland women's will do now in the up and coming Six Nations um, they obviously announced the squad the other day very young squad very exciting to see a lot of new names in there and, and um, a lot of like our, our old teammates and our friends in there who, who are brilliant and um yeah, it'll be a challenge. And like, of course, when you look at then the the English squad that's been released, like just uh, and just the fact that they're full time players, I just want to see that start to grow. Obviously, you know, contracts have come into it now, but it's very slow start. Like a lot of players weren't able to take that up. And um, as we're going into this Six Nations, you know, you're kind of like when the gap started to open with us, we were always aiming for third third is the best you know not aiming to win a six nations because France and England were the pro teams and then we were kind of like trying our best to be professional and then going to work on a Monday morning like mm. not able to like like look over your shoulder because you're because you're just you know your body's in it, it needs to recover so much but like you don't have time for that so aiming for third um is will be will be good if they were able to get a third place like that that'll be good for them but it won't be easy um and uh and do you see the positives like obviously myself and greg and jason have and pat obviously have spoken about so we had the the celtic league which ireland won yeah. four out of four games um so that's obviously a huge positive we came out on top a lot of players that are in that squad now got blooded through that yep so 
firstly keep that in mind and then we obviously spoke about a women's Lions tour like do you think though are is the women's game ready for a Lions tour and do you think that the these Celtic leagues is this what's needed to help Irish rugby on the women's side move on quickly and then even the Lions tour are we ready for that and then we'll probably um a Lions tour is an interesting one because again you look at the do you know, the full-time players that have been able to grow into the players there in England and France and then to have, you know, someone who's, like, teaching or, or whatever, do you know, as her job, like, going to Lions Tour is just a, a big... I, yeah, I don't think that women's rugby is at a place now where Lions Tour would be a good idea. We haven't got the pool of players, have we? Yeah, because really? <laughs> England do because they're paid full-time and they're full-time Sorry, players I mentioned France there. Obviously, yeah. France aren't up for selection, but sorry, that's what, what, yeah. where my thoughts are going. But yeah. No, but same kind of thing. Like, Ireland, women aren't, there are not enough people play, play professionally and mm. not playing full-time to go on a Lions tour. As you yeah. said, they had to give their careers. Yeah. Wales only, what, have 12 contracts or something? She's on that there still, like. And they're yeah. still all over the place. I don't know what Scotland is. So I don't think women's rugby, I don't think a quick fix is, let's go to the top and create a top-level tournament and yeah. send them down to South Africa. I think it's it's what you're doing, Anna, and like you're at the grassroots and you're trying to promote the game from the ground up. And it's slowly starting to get there. And yeah. I think women's rugby took a massive step with the World Cup. Even people like myself who've been in the rugby world, I didn't realise how how good women's rugby actually is. I, I was watching the semi-finals and finals and I was like, these girls could beat some international men's teams, like yeah. second tier men's teams. Yeah. They are that good at rugby. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, it is there. So why aren't the Irish team there? And then I started thinking, I was like, it's actually really sad the Irish team aren't there. Because yeah. I was covering it for world rugby. And I was like, okay, what needs to be done at home then? And then people like yourself who are fighting the fight, which is amazing. And do you feel like you are starting to get a bit of return from it? Do you feel like the you are listening and they're starting to do something about it or a lot more still needs to be done? Sometimes I feel like, yeah. And obviously the, the players took a big step last year and we, you know, wrote an open letter to... Um, uh, to the the IRFU, you know, stating that we we want more from this and we're not so happy with how it's been going. And yeah, I feel like there's changes made and and like there's an under eighteen Six Nations festival for the girls this year as well. Which when I read that, I was like, oh my god, like finally, like awesome. Um, but that needs to kind of continue. Like so, it's not just a fact of right that's happening now. So great, you know, it's it's gotta keep moving to get to catch up to England, to catch up to other teams that have like just like steamrolled ahead it's not going to stop with just the Sunder 18s festival or just the Celtic Cup or yeah. just it's got to keep rolling and yeah. yeah 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 and like consistently good as well but it's not going to just happen that this is going to work that's going to work that's going to work yes mm. this is all working brilliantly it's not going to happen that way either because we're learning about it but if we go back to talking about like the Lions tour for, for a second we don't have to do everything exactly the same as the men's the way men's rugby has gone. Like, it can be, it can go, we can do things a different way. And they are talking about doing the, the the Lions tour slightly different if they do. Like, they would go to France and Canada and, you know, not do the same tour. Mm. But it doesn't have to be, we can write our own rules. You know, it's on the verge of professionalism now. So I hope we can do it in a style that will suit us. So what change would you like to see that you think would benefit us, say, at home? Just to make it more specific for you, what if you were to come in and say, I want this one change, what would it be? Would you like more competitions like the Celtic Cup or would you like to start with underage or in the clubs? Because we're kind of at a loss. Where do we start? Where's the starting point? Yeah, um, it's hard because there's a hundred different ways to skin a cat, obviously. So no one answer is going to be the the only answer. But what, what, I'd, would you do? what I'd love to see if it was me and the powers in my hands was uh, invest in the league, the AIL. OK, because if we can't go all professional all in like one of the most difficult things and you, you'd probably like attest to this Greg as well is when you're playing for Munster especially if you're underage or you're in college or you're working um, the, the travel to Limerick down to Cork girls coming up from Kerry Tipperary Clonmel wherever you're going it's a lot of time on the road which can be taken out of it if you go professional but we're not going to be able to go professional straight away so if you can localise your where you're putting in the resources so I only have to drive 20 minutes to the gym that's done and, and 10 minutes to the pitch and I get all my work done because I'm going to have to any player coming in now is going to have to keep her job or keep her studies to, to become the best player she can on the side and then slowly over time that's when you learn your professional contracts but like 
to, to kind of be relocated to the provinces now that's going to be really hard and a lot of investment I'd love to just see it happen in the clubs first and then kind of push forward I probably would agree that would have contracted players back to the club yeah because I think as well you well say Bowes you're an ex Bowes Red Robin so I'd like to see working out the university so there's no excuse that the University of Limerick who have a high class gym that the the Munster lads work out of so all the facilities are there the attraction is there as a university for a young young girl so you could use the scholarships through UL you can also contract some big names to attract names to your club mm. and then the resources are there and put an overall SNC program filtering back down to the clubs so I think everything can be centralised from the IRFU but filter down and put the, mm. the resources in the clubs and I think you're right we've said this before on the, on, on the pod there's no not every framework whether it's sevens or men's or, or AIL clubs whether men or women is going to suit you have to see what works um, so hopefully we'll see it down the line and be talking a lot more and what is just kind of wrap it up on the Irish women's scenario what is the current situation with the women's 15s team there are some people contracted but at a very low amount uh, I think we've 30 contracts already gone in if I'm not mistaken I actually don't know the number at the moment I, I'm going to say around 30 I've I, I feel that's right but a lot of them have previously been contracted as our sevens I definitely know there's only a handful of 15s who would have been predominantly 15 players and we lost a lot through retirement um, and I can't name names because they haven't really officially announced themselves so I'm not going to but there's a lot of probably players that have been not included in, in the squad that was announced last week that wouldn't have by choice um, they just unfortunately through personal circumstances had to make those decisions for themselves because they just couldn't live on the contracts and then how do you compete for a jersey with full time professionals who are contracted you know the, even within a squad that would be my point as a as an onlooker looking in on it I'm like you, if you want the likes of the Irish women's team to compete in the Six Nations against England or France or Wales who are somewhat professionally contracted as well you need to contract a full squad of women to let them completely focus and give all their time and energy mm -hmm. to the team in order to compete it was like when we were trying to play sevens we were like how can you expect us to earn money mm -hmm. and eat and pay rent and travel up from Limerick and you want us to go against like New Zealand I was like it's just not going to work mm -hmm. lads yeah. and eventually they started listening so mm -hmm. I think the from a, and obviously I, I can't change anything really but I can I can give my opinion on it yeah. I think they should contract a full Irish women's team they have enough money the men's team are the best team in the world take a little money off the, off the whole budget give it to the women's team contract a full Irish women's squad and then go down to the grassroots and start putting good SNCs into clubs and good coaches into clubs and make and build it up from the ground up but you can't then send the women over to the Six Nations they get a hockey in our friends and then expect a young 16 year old girl to look at the Irish women's team who are after getting hockeyed mm. so why would she want to play with the team that's getting hockeyed do you know yeah. what I mean so you need to do it on both ends and then meet, a, meet in the middle I think but I um, think Greg you know you're saying they're like you know I can't change anything but like neither can I neither can Lindsay but these conversations that we have now and like the fact that you're you know you're sharing your thoughts like this is what we need to do is talk about it so like you know, thanks for being an ally to the women's game and like these conversations are yeah. so important and have them and ask people, what do you think? And it, even just someone listening to this now will now think about it when they're watching Six Nations next month. And, um, yeah. you know, that, that that's this is what needs to happen uh, continuously. We keep asking, we keep looking and we keep like... I think yeah. the big 14 game right at the weekend had over 15,000 at that women's club game. Brilliant. Uh, Exeter came out on top. Um, oh geez, it was a big score and it was such an exciting game. Um, Gloucester would play at King's Home now and again. So the fact that, and I hate coming back to English teams. I hate it, but I have to, you have to come back to the standard bearers. And again, it's about the exposure. They're linked with a men's club now. So King's Home and Gloucester men and women, like the big 14 obviously had men and women's teams both playing in Twickenham. Um, and again, to have over 15,000 on a club game, when we played with the Barbarians, we unbeknownst for ourselves set a new record at 28,000 because the men unfortunately had to get cancelled by COVID. But we yeah, took it we, and we, we were now the on the stage to be the main main attraction. It was lovely. Yeah, we accidentally broke a world record that day. We were in the same car, you, me and... Um, we were in a taxi dancing and they were like, oh, do, here's the supporters and we were actually playing. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you know what happened that day? Yeah, you that had to get Ubers. You were called to come in early. We were like, yeah, because, uh, you know, the, the men's side, the men's got cancelled, which was very sad for them, but great for us. We're waiting in the hotel and I, it was taking so long. I was like... I was oh. meant to get a present from Argus for, Bar for Barrett <laughs> for Christmas and I had to send someone oh, else yeah. up because we were like out the gap and I was like, how am I going to get it? I'd send Cleena Maloney actually. 
actually. The bus wasn't <laughs> the bus wasn't ready, so we all had to order Ubers and uh, go to Twiggin' and Moon Ubers and I was like this is so cool we'll get to play at 2 o'clock so it'll be on primetime telly it was only when I was in the taxi I was like hang on there's already 40,000 people on the way to Twickenham here I never, it never dawned on me until we were in the car and we were saying to the, the, the yeah. Uber driver like turn up the music turn up the music we were like da 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 Justin like, <laughs> Karen won the Canadians it was, uh, it was brilliant that was one of, that's oh, definitely one the of the highlights you got into the one of the opposition players no, 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 it's the Barbarians. Oh, Barbarians. Barbarians. No, she was, yeah, no, okay. she was uh, absolutely brilliant. But like, we just had to roll with it. Like, I hadn't, e- we hadn't even had our pre-match meal. We just had the breakfast, but it was gas crack. And to be honest, you just, uh, that's that probably you, one of my standout memories. I love yeah. that you took that in your stride and you're so happy to tell that story. And it's a yeah. good moment for you. I, the men, if that happened to them, they'd be whinging and complaining. And like, oh, we can't play, you joking, yeah. I'm going to an Uber and not eat my pre-match meal. Yeah. So I just think it just shows how much you appreciate the game and appreciate getting the supporters. Oh, uh-huh. mm-hmm. the only downside for me was I got to take a conversion and I absolutely made a shit of it. <laughs> That's funny though. Oh my though, God, though. I forgot that. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what was so cool? I was in, uh, I was in La Rochelle um, a, few, a few months after that and I met a man in a pub and he was, I can't remember how we got onto it, but he was like, oh, I was just talking about women's rugby. I love women's rugby. Do you know what happened last year? I went to watch the Barbarians play in Twickenham and do you know what happened? The... The men's game got cancelled and the women played and they were great. And I was like, go away, isn't that gas <laughs> now? Um, fair play. Did you tell him? I actually, I said to him, I was like, do you remember the number eight? And he was like, yeah. I was like, that was me. And he was like, he was like, I'm so, um, I'm so upset you didn't ask me who my favourite player was on the day because I was about to say the number no eight for the Barbarians. He might have been talking talking through his hoop, but, <laughs> but it was so, gas was so cool and he was telling me all about it and he was so excited and like, that was his accidentally first experience of women's rugby and he was telling this to me like... I, I love women's rugby now. So it's things like this that you, we need to, like, and women's rugby has done, like, just take it in two hands and run with it. So yeah. we kind of bring an, enough people on, on the bandwagon with us. Yeah, we yeah. will. And what, we, we have to wrap up soon, but I'm loving this chat about the women's rugby. One thing I wanted to ask for more from, from my world is the sevens. So that what the women's do, you have a lot of mixture between the sevens players and the fifteens players, and they're all intertwined and play all the different tournaments, the kind of same pool of players, which doesn't happen in the men's team. There's mm. a sevens team and there's a fifteens team and they don't really cross over. Um, so do you think that's the best thing to be doing is to be using all the best players in Ireland? And it doesn't matter if they're sevens players or do you think they should be separating it completely? Because I know that Emily Murphy Crow, Eve Higgins and Bevin Parsons all missed out in Six Nations games mm. again. So do you think that's good to separate the teams completely? Yeah. I, I, so they, they obviously released the, the Six Nations squad this a um, few days ago without any sevens players named, whether that changes down the line, but sevens have a huge priority. Um, with the Olympic year. With, with their Olympic qualification yeah. and everything. So that's got to be priority for them. But at the same time, it, 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 it is difficult to manage and it's often difficult as a player to, to, um, to have uh, players come in that kind of maybe haven't been there because they've been away. Not their fault, no one's fault ever, but like, and then they come straight back into a squad and you have to kind of go back to basics to get everyone up to the same level and that can be hard to manage. And, you know, the players always did it so brilliantly, but it's just how it was managed was, was often difficult. And it depends, like if you need a player, definitely, if a sevens player is available, definitely bring her in. But when you kind of have a squad that's building towards something and then it kind of gets changed because the sevens players are suddenly available that can be hard to manage yeah um, I thought it was absolutely outrageous when a sevens player was came available and they just threw him into starting a 15s team I was like that would never in a million years happen in the 15s I'd keep them separate men's game yeah yeah, you think you have to do if they're trying to play at the top level in both sports. I think personally, yeah. sevens is a completely different sport to rugby fifteens. Yeah, and the I, girls did great the weekend yeah, in Vancouver. Great, like yeah. um, Eastman Hall crossfield kick to Bevan. Like they're they're doing exceptionally, yeah. and I think they should be given that license to have concentration now this year, yeah. regardless of being an Olympic qualifier. The only time I would see them come in is if we're building towards a World Cup. But a bit like Ruby Tui, um, one of the standout players from this year's World Cup, um, and Stacey Walker, the same thing. Just uh, 
that they're blooded in time. Do you know that they're now integrated at least six months before and then they give their time to 15s mm. if that's what they're going to do. Mm-hmm. Players can't be punished for being exceptional at both, but you are absolutely right. It takes so much time to blood and transition from being a sevens to a 15. They're two totally different games. Yeah. And I don't think it's fair on the players that come in and I don't think it's fair on the players there. So I don't think players should be punished, but I think it should be separate until a certain point if you're building up to, say, a, a Rugby World Cup. Yeah. Bring our sevens in who are exceptional athletes, but give them the time mm-hmm. minimum six months. Um, and I think that's fair, fair for competition, fair for them transition. Um, but I think it also then puts the onus on the programme to blood in the 15s and deepen the squad. We have fabulous athletes around the country um, and we shouldn't have to rely on players. Like there's no need for Emily to be playing like her, her load alone as an athlete has to be managed from that sense. And I'm just picking her out randomly. There's many players f- from that. So I think we've, we're a country of, we're, we're, we're blessed with the amount of athletes we have. Yeah. We just need to find them. I agree with you completely. Now, Anna, before we let you go, we just want to know what you're up to now. I believe you might've played a bit of tens rugby recently. You're oh, in yeah. Spain, yeah. living in Spain and you have your own podcast. Tell us about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually, so yeah, I played in the, the world tens championship in South Africa in October which was class. That was brilliant. A kind of a different world, um, kind of an American style of, of rugby academy. And it was created through these like American um, links. And uh, God, it was brilliant. We had two weeks out in South Africa. And that was that was amazing. And I was playing with a team called the Honey Badgers, like these brand new franchises that have these like lovely new names. And we won everything. Um, it was savage. And yeah so since then so from there I went to the World Cup and enjoyed myself for a little while because after a time from Ireland I just took time out to kind of enjoy rugby and now I've yeah moved to Spain to practice my Spanish and I'm I'm playing coaching over there and uh, eating plenty tapas and drinking <laughs> lovely wine and um, that's you know a, a side of that I've been waiting to enjoy as well from after a time from Ireland like so um, yeah and I yeah started a podcast recently for the Six Nations and just rugby in general would like just to have the crack around it because actually last year after a time from Ireland a lot of like media um, opportunities and I turned everything down because I just wasn't in a good place personally like I was Mm -hmm. quite heartbroken after deciding to step away from Ireland so just kind of gave myself time to heal and then it was actually New Year's Eve I'd got on to Tom uh, O'Mahony who's the my co-host and I was like, right, we spoke about this before. This is my New Year's resolution just to kind of get back in the bandwagon now with all of the, the things that have been offered and wanting to do. So, yeah, we started a podcast and it's great crack. What's the podcast called? It's called the Banana and Bears Rugby Pod. Oh, brilliant. Nice. You can get it anywhere you listen to podcasts. Yes, yes, brilliant indeed. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So after you finish listening to House Rugby, lads, go over and listen to Anna's. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> We're not plugging it that much. <laughs> <laughs> We're still competitive. Oh, so, definitely. And we, we'll never see you um, back over in Irish Shores playing rugby again. Sure, who knows? Honestly, I, I, I deliberately make myself very free so that any opportunities that come, why, that, that, that come my way, uh, I can take them or not. But I'm already in... Um, putting um, something in place for next season mm. I'm not finished playing yet okay watch this space watch this same space. as you Lindsay you'll never give it up alright thanks so much Anna I really appreciate it for railway <laughs> 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 and I'm going to balls <laughs> <laughs> oh god Joe presents House of Rugby together with Bank of Ireland proud supporter of the four Irish provinces 